some of you might have heard press reports about the, um, the boycott Sri, Sri Lankan cricket uh, campaign, which was very much led um, in Australia by the chap to my left um, and Trevor Grant, who I, who I mentioned before. Um, but Aaron Mayavaganam's involvement in that boycott Sri Lankan cricket campaign is all the more impressive given his own experience of coming to this country as a refugee. And Aaron's going to reflect on that experience for you tonight. Over to you, Aaron. And thank you very much for making the trip over from Melbourne to join us. Thank you, Sam. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. I hope I get it right. I'm from Melbourne. Uh, Wujak Noonga people, I would like to acknowledge their elders past and present. Organizers have asked me to share my experience as a refugee and the genocide I survived. Firstly, I would like to thank the Australian Greens, Socialist Alliance, and independent activists for continuously speaking out against the ongoing genocide of the Tamil people in north and east of Sri Lanka. When thousands of Australian Tamils protested against the killings in 2009, Bob Brown was the only politician who stood with us. These photos, this photo exhibition, not only exposes the Sri Lankan government's genocidal acts, it also exposes the lies of the Australian Labour Party and the Liberal Party. Like Professor Rajeswaran said, Tamil genocide did not start nor end in 2009. People of Tamil Ulam have faced 60 years of genocide at the hands of successive Sri Lankan governments and the genocide continues to this date. I am a witness to the Sri Lankan government's crimes in the 90s. In the 1990s, Sri Lankan government propagated a war for peace campaign in which they were aimed to inflict massive casualties on the Tamil population. I'm from a small village called Nagarkovil in northern Tamil Ulam. I have witnessed deliberate bombings of churches, schools, and civilian settlements. Sri Lankan army would come and drop leaflets via helicopters asking us to stay in the schools and churches for safety. And they bombed these places. I was studying at Nagarkovil uh, High School in Nagarkovil. Over 750 students studied there. On September 22nd, 1995, Sri Lankan Air Force bombed our school. Seven bombs were dropped on my school. The first bomb was dropped nearby our school. All the 750 students ran outside when we first heard it. These were 750 students in plain white uniform. That's when the Sri Lankan Air Force dropped six bombs. They saw us and they killed us. On that day, my 14-year-old brother, we found Kanan cut in half murdered in cold blood by the Sri Lankan Air Force. As an 11-year-old boy, on that day, I had to witness my classmate 
hanging on a tamarind tree by his intestines. On that day, we picked up our six-year-old cousin's body, Tarsini, in pieces. Tens of children were killed on that day. And a few weeks later, a uh, Sri Lankan army came back again. They attacked our village, this time from their military base. And, and this attack targeted a fish market. And in that attack, only a newborn baby survived. After that bombing, uh, my family internally displaced to Vanni, and we lived in a refugee camp for more than a year. Tamil Tigers uh, Civil Administration in Vanni looked after us. They provided us with uh, three meals a day and uh, built a cottage for us to live in that area. In 1997, I escaped Sri Lanka's, uh, Sri Lankan Army's air attacks and came to Australia as a 13-year-old refugee, as an unaccompanied minor on my own, and I was detained in Willowood Detention Centre for three months. I have come from Melbourne, all the way from Melbourne, uh, to this even today to share my experience because I can't sleep at night when our government and the opposition is easily demonizing and dehumanizing refugees and sending them back to the, uh, uh, to the oppressive regimes. I can't sleep at night when the Labour Party and the Liberal Party members continuously speak out in support of the brutal Rajapaksha regime. This needs to change, and the change will only come through grassroots agitation. With respect to Melissa Park, she said many things about the opposition, as well as she did say some things about Bob Carr, but what she didn't say is, earlier this year, three Victorian MPs, Labour Party MPs, visited Sri Lanka and called Mahinda Rajapaksha a man who is responsible for all these photos that, see, that you see around us, they called Mahinda Rajabaksha a man of courage. Liz Beatty, who is the Victorian State MP and also a founding member of uh, Emily's List, called Mahinda Rajapaksha, a man who has used rape as a weapon of war, as a man of courage. Every time members of the Labour Party talk about Sri Lanka's human rights abuses, they should first apologize for their party's support to the regime not leave us with empty words. Sri Lankan government carried out the first genocide of the 21st century with the help of the Australian Labour government. History will never forget this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening in Tamlulam today is an unimaginable psychological torture for our people. Apart from the physical harm they are subject to with impunity, even as we speak. The arrest of disappearance campaigner Jay Kumari and her 13-year-old daughter from their home on 13th of March and their separation in custody has sent shock waves 
in the Tamil diaspora. It is hard to imagine the brutality of it all, but there is no condemnation from the Australian government. As a member of the UN Security Council, Australia should act more responsibly. The Australian government, despite uh, being gi uh, given evidence by its own uh, parliamentarians, it has chosen to take sides with Sri Lankan regime. Stories of refugees are completely ignored by this government. Recently, I met up with a Tamil refugee who fled Sri Lanka, and this story was shared on 7.30 report uh, in November. He was sexually assaulted by the Sri Lankan army for six months in 2012. Every time this refugee refused to have sex with the members of the Sri Lankan army men, they would insert an Eslon pipe through his anus and they inserted a barbed wire through the pipe to torture him. When he finally managed to flee Sri Lanka, his wife was taken by the army. She was gang raped by the army men only in June 2013. Now, she is fighting for her life in a refugee camp in another country. And this is the reality for Tamils in Sri Lanka. Australian authorities know this. They have seen the evidence, but they are blinded by the Sri Lankan lobby groups. And I say this, that the Australian government and the opposition do not care about the lives of Tamils. Australia that chooses to detain 42 Tamil asylum seekers because of their involvement in the Tamil freedom struggle do not care about the lives of the Tamils. From 2006 to this date, Tamils are being harassed by the Australian Security and Intelligence Organization. ASIO have been tasked to work actively with the Sri Lankan government to silence the Tamil diaspora. This cold-blooded and cruel Australian government's stand on Sri Lanka can only be tackled by mobilizing the people. There is no point in wasting our time with these cold-hearted uh, parliamentarians. And we, the Tamils and non-Tamil activists, will work together with grassroots organizations and put pressure on Australia to stand side by side with international human rights organizations, not with the war criminals from Sri Lanka, nor the ambassador who's also a war criminal from Sri Lanka. We, the Tamils and the non-Tamil activists, will work together and put pressure on Australia to call for a referendum for Tamils to exercise their right to self-determination. Ladies and gentlemen, over 70,000 Tamils were killed in May 2009 because of the Sri Lankan government's inhumanity to Tamils. From 1948, successive Sri Lankan governments have killed hundreds of thousands of Tamils because they were Tamils. We can't expect justice from the Sri Lankan state. Only the good men and women all around the world can bring justice to the Tamil people. Thank you.